Okay, so who is the presenter for the work plan? So this is or with presenters. Dave. Yeah, so this is okay. a request from Dave to talk about their annual work program. Super. So go ahead and begin by introducing yourself and uh, or all of you at once and then uh, whoever wishes to go first. I don't know. Oh, sounds like it's working. Good morning. I'm Seth Halling with AKS Engineering, um, the 2023 chair for the Clark County um, Development and Engineering Advisory Board. Uh, with me is Sherry Jones, who was the vice chair the previous year, current chair, as well as Ryan Wilson, um, who is vice chair on this year. Um, so we wanted to just uh, briefly go over the uh, report from the prior year, uh, some of the accomplishments, and then move into a discussion with council regarding the work plan for the current year. Um, one item I wanted to point out was we have a new member, um, Brian Cast. Um, he's with the City of La Center uh, Public Works Director. Um, so on the next page, um, I'll just run through these briefly and you know, I guess we can uh, feel free to interrupt me or if you want to hold questions till later, uh, I'm fine either way. Um, so we, one of the focuses has been um, looking at ways to maintain housing affordability. Uh, a large portion of that has come through the housing options plan and working with that group to then implement that into uh, a code that we can, can uh, make a recommendation to council as far as uh, where there's issues that arise, um, you know, with the expertise in the development sector, uh, there's a lot of feedback that we can provide input on, um, areas that would restrict or, uh, I guess be an issue in terms of affordability. And so we worked uh, with staff and their consultant to, you know, identify where those constraints are. Um, there is the streamlining of customer service. Um, we've continued to get updates and provide feedback to county staff on the electronic reviews as well as any wait time or other challenges that we see. Um, another item which was on the plan is to look at implementing a streamlined process specifically for type two um, reviews. And that is a process that's frequently used in the city of Vancouver's jurisdiction. Other jurisdictions in the county as well have it. And it allows the duration for permitting review to be shortened um, leading to, you know, the helping with costs being uh, kept down as well as allowing for um, especially the commercial developments to move forward quicker, um, construct and then bring in uh, that tax revenue and create jobs. Uh, so that we made recommendations to staff working with April Firth and development engineering. They're working on a couple of pilot uh, projects uh, to kind of review uh, what the, you know, if there's any, uh, I guess, bumps in the road with going forward with that. But um, we've strongly recommended following City of Vancouver's process um, as a roadmap for that. Item number three regarding landscape standards in the multifamily zoning, outdoor recreation use um, is a topic that we've heard uh, quite a bit about in the previous, uh, I guess, two years. And so we've continued to provide input on that and how that uh, can be implemented into code to, um, I guess, change and, and the, to better uh, provide more affordable housing, you know, looking at, you know, we understand that it was a policy decision or change there and so it's, it's a being monitored as an item that's going to be continuing on our work plan. Um, early involvement in policy and code changes. Uh, when there is recent changes with uh, fish and wildlife, uh, we invited guests to come and provide 
a presentation on that and an overview of how those changes would affect um, you know, the county code and then how that could be implemented. Um, we provided input on the buildable lands report, uh, provided that feedback to staff, planning commission and council, um, worked with staff on code changes, including side setbacks on eaves, gutters, easements, the cottage code, road modifications and calculations of density. Um, some of those items are ones that were here before you a little bit earlier this morning. Um, shoreline code amendments, review of the wetland and habitat, critical areas ordinances, um, floodplain ordinance updates, the changes to equestrian facilities and agricultural building codes. Um, and then the last item H on this list was the park impact fee credits and as a way to, um, I guess, encourage developers to incorporate these into their private developments um, and as a way to, I guess, offset some of that cost. Uh, and that's an item that has been, had further discussion uh, with Rocky Houston and I believe it still remains on our work plan to uh, get that or implement it. Um, Review of upcoming county changes. So a large part of this uh, ties back to the Growth Management Act, the 2025 comprehensive plan update. Uh, there's been a lot of input from members of the advisory board um, to, or with, I guess, uh, working with staff, the planning commission, as well as council, um, providing our recommendations on those items. Um, There were updates to the traffic impact fees and the traffic improvement program, as well as the circulation and 179th access management. So each of those items are ones that have come uh, before DEEB and we've provided input recommendations on those. And I believe that is a brief overview of the items. And Chair, I have a question before we go on to the next year. I, I, I was wondering about the equestrian facility, facility and agricultural building. I wasn't f familiar with the changes related to equestrian facilities. You, what happened there? Sure. Yeah. I'm Ryan Wilson. I'm with Wilson Architects. I'm currently the only architect member of DEEB. So, um, Anything that goes vertical is probably falls into my purview. Um, and April may be able to jump on. I think she was a little bit more involved in some of these than me. Um, my take on that was historically, you know, the building codes really only dealt with occupied buildings. So, um, and that was mainly a life safety issue. So a lot of those exemptions and a lot of jurisdictions still have them where, you know, if you've got a hay barn or something like that, it's really not an occupied facility. So the life safety issues are pretty minimal. Um, you know, just people periodically going in there. Um, the challenge that typically arises is that a lot of those buildings that were built later become something else. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, either somebody wants to put an ADU in there or um, convert it to some sort of a commercial structure. And so you've got a building that, you know, really wasn't designed or permitted to any particular code. Um, and how do you do with that? You know, it's, it's tough to kind of reverse engineer it. Um, so, so this just really has to do with not being exempt and going through a permitting process, it's, it, it wasn't really changes to what is, well, maybe, or is it just being consistent with the state code? Well, um, like I said, the, the code really doesn't address unoccupied buildings at all. So there, there is kind of a U occupancy in the code, which kind of deals with like um, accessory structures, uh, equipment buildings and whatnot. But 
you know, the, the building code really isn't intended to deal with just rural unoccupied buildings. So um, it was it was more that the codes just didn't address them at all. I just wondered if it changed what that change was. Maybe April can help us. I think, um, hi, April Firth, Director of Community Development. I, I, when I saw this, I was thinking that they meant, um, because we did, of course, come to them um, with the elimination of the ag exemption and um, got their feedback and they were supportive of it. So I think that that, I thought that that's what they meant by this. Okay, th thanks. I think that clears it up for me. So uh, the issues that have come up before with equestrian use really and building codes focus on the covered arenas where we did have bleachers and people expected to come in. Yeah. And then the wind shear and other requirements kicked in to make sure the building wouldn't blow down on them. Uh, there weren't any changes in that area. I mean, that, that's that been pretty consistent code application for equestrian use, correct? From the, in terms of the building codes? Yes. 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 Okay. Do you have? I would just say, I think there were other issues that came up related to equestrian some years ago, and I think there's some uncertainty if all, if those things got clarified, but may have nothing to do with this. Yeah, the blow up a couple of years ago, what we ultimately determined was none of those codes applied uh, in the context that everyone thought they applied. And so I, I think that's way behind us. I don't think there were any changes. Uh, other questions before we move on? Uh, just a comment and a question. Uh, Please. You know, all of these really look, sound familiar. Not all of them. 90% uh, of them sound familiar for your <laughs> contributions as we went along. But it's actually quite amazing to see them amalgamated like this. And the quantity and depth of what Deeb has accomplished is is pretty amazing. And thank you for your your great work. I have a question up on, I believe it was 1C. Uh, if you wouldn't mind popping up there again on the on the list. Um, what accomplishment is referred to in that language? The landscape, one, is that the no, big one? No, one, one C, C is, that were not included in the housing affordability. The landscape. That's a really hard question, Karen. They're contemplating <laughs> it right now. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. It was the code okay. that we just discussed yesterday. Yeah. And oh, is it not on? No, I'm on. Okay. So, when, oh, Eric Colimo, SGA Engineering, and a, a D member as well. And when we, when you guys had the initial work session for the, the housing options study, there were quite a few recommendations that we made that didn't make it to that code. We testified at that, at that work session or at the first hearing, and then it went back to staff because a lot of the recommendations were not included in that plan. So after that, we worked with staff to get most of them included or at least come to a reasonable compromise. So a lot of work went into that. And a lot of, a lot of it wasn't, Maybe differences in perspective and, and differences in, in kind of explaining both of our sides and what the potential unintended consequences would be and how to best serve the community. So I think we ended up at a pretty good point. There was, I think even yesterday at the hearing, there was one item where there was some, there wasn't clarity. And I was trying to, I wanted to try to get your attention like during the hearing because it was, it was regarding the parking. And we kind of answered a, a multiple choice question with a yes. So, and and I, I think it just wasn't conveyed because there were three different options I think brought to you guys on how to handle the parking. And what happened was it was just, yes, we'll adopt it. But there wasn't a decision on those three options, which you might want to revisit with staff, but a little off topic, right. but that is what we're talking about on the, uh, on the housing options and the participation we had on that. Are you referring to the two versus 2.5? Yes. Um, okay, thank currently you. Currently, it was 2.5. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. But a little thank off topic, but the, that was what we were working on. Yeah. I understand uh, now your, your intent there with 1C, and thank you. 
So I was going to hold off some of my comments to the very end, but I'm, I'm going to, because of what Karen just said, I, number one, we are very grateful for your persistence and for helping guide uh, the work that we did. And, and we heard you loud and clear when a lot of those uh, changes that you proposed were not adopted initially and a lot of hard work went in afterwards and then yesterday's culminating, although we haven't adopted the ordinance yet, but all of your hard work is very much appreciated and it will make for better code. I am so impressed by the depth and breadth of this work. And so I'm hope my one concern is, oh my gosh, our, do they have this capacity? I mean, you're not getting paid a whole lot um, aside from your job. <laughs> and yeah, and he's, for this greater audience, he was holding up a zero. Um, so I'm, I don't want to overcast you. And so I'm hoping this is workable because we rely so heavily on you. And I, because I was going to have two specific asks. And it, it, one was based in part with a conversation I had with Eric over a year ago or so. <clears throat> Permitting. You know, there are codes where there's um, difference of opinion, different interpretation, and maybe that code needs to be changed or maybe it just, we need a singular focus on to make sure all staff are interpreting the code in the same way. But within the permitting process, we've had occasion where there was disagreement throughout the process and it was holding up the permit. And especially for big developments, that's a lot of money. Every week that goes by, material prices go up. It costs a lot of money. And that, you know, we, when we talk about affordability, so yeah, I want to put an exclamation on, point on that. Please keep work on affordability. How do we get permitting prices down, timelines down, costs down, so we can attain what we targeted yesterday in our affordable uh, housing quest? So what I was proposing, and I, I think actually maybe Eric had suggested that it is within your portfolio to be kind of an independent body. So when a developer or a private homeowner says I, I, they're interpreting this wrong or too narrowly, and that persists even when it goes all the way up to the head uh, engineer or public works, and it just persists and it keeps dragging on. I would like to have a, an appellate avenue, if you will, for that contractor, developer, homeowner to come to Deeb and say, give us your input. Now, public safety, public welfare is at the bottom line of what everyone wants to do. We want to make sure stuff is built that's safe and it will withstand wind and earthquakes and you name it. Uh, but I would like to see that happen. I think there's been pushback because I've suggested it before. Um, so April, I know you're on. I don't know if Ken Later's on, but I'd like to see that put in place. And so my question to you is whether or not you have the capacity to fulfill that role. I don't know how often it would come up. You're thinking of a applicant initiated process? Correct. I, I, yeah. I didn't, I'm sorry. We do that now, but not often. That is in our purview, and we have uh, heard kind of uh, either they want to If you could come up to a mic, yeah. because I know April's on listening as well, so I want to make yeah. sure that, and our other counselors can speak. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been on the board for a few years, so I've got a little more history on, on some of the topics, but that is in our purview, and we have heard those situations where an applicant comes to us with a disagreement that they had with staff, and then we are an independent sounding board, and then we kind of re re make a recommendation back to staff, and most of the time staff has, has taken that recommendation to heart, and we came up with a pretty reasonable compromise, so we do that. So, so is there anything more we need to do to formalize that process, or do you think it's working right now? I 
I think that would be, uh, so Sherry Jones, I'm with the Southwest Washington Contractors Association. So to Eric's point, I think they're one-offs that happen to come up. Typically, sometimes April will bring one forward, but typically it comes directly from the applicant, and then one of us bring it to Deeb's attention. But there's no formal process to answer your question. It's sort of a one-off scenario, either staff identifies or someone that we're working with identifies, but there's no no clear process. Okay, so thanks for that. So back to my original point, I would like to see it formalized so an applicant knows that if they run into trouble uh, with the code interpretation, they have an avenue. And, and it came up recently in a different context, and I'll just throw it out there because it's brand new, I'm still trying to think about it. And I think the uh, constituents went to each of the counselors individually, and I, so I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a situation where um, <coughs> the neighborhood or constituency around the development um, even took it to court and and different uh, and it's a safety issue with roads and rural country roads not able to handle the existing development that's there but now going to be pressured further um, by the this continuing development and so uh, what their request was hey we need an independent consultant to look at this because, number one, the courts really aren't addressing the underlying code issue. They're just saying whether or not the county acted properly within the code. And, you know, so I was, first thing I thought of, well, I don't want to spend more money for the county on a consultant to take a look and double check what, what staff is doing as far as road safety on these developments. But maybe Deeb could take a look at it. Uh, and give an independent view on, for purposes of informing the council on whether further action needs to uh, occur, either a road improvement or a change on the proposed development. So I'm uh, just throwing that out there. What would your comments be? I think we would agree that that would be a great process. Um, be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think that, you know, while there's a lot of things on the work plan, a lot of these items we maybe provide input, but ultimately we're just a sounding board versus something like this. We are actually influencing a little more, having a little more um, input, like you said, the independent review. I think that that is likely more valuable. I mean, speaking from this side of things, I think that's more valuable perhaps um, than some of the other items that we look at that we provide a quick five minute insight and then move on and that's all we, we do with it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so you had another? I just, I just had a comment on that. I think there's a need to proceed somewhat cautiously on this because it could be a very much expanding role, so we'd have to look at that, and it could be, uh, in terms of streamlining permitting process, it could add a, a quite a bit to to that process, but being familiar with the case that I believe you brought up, sometimes there may be mistakes. Uh, some decisions go back a few years, and then they play out, and and you can just see that this isn't this isn't working. So I think, uh, you know, I like, I like the idea of, of and appreciate your willingness to do this in an informal way, but if we're changing your scope of work and, uh, you know, unintended consequences and things like that, on the one hand, people might not know t to even go to you to get an opinion, and it may be just, you know, your, the context that each of you have individually are aware of certain circumstances. And I do think in that particular instance, it would, it's a very good idea uh, to, to, to have a, another opinion look at this if you all are willing to do that. So, so that's kind of, kind of yes, and let's be cautious about this. Okay, so great. I appreciate this discussion and the price would be right for the general fund <laughs> to do this. <laughs> yeah. So um, please, uh, it's 10 a.m., so please continue with your presentation. Chair? I'm sorry, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, just on, on this subject, when I'm looking at this, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is 
um, you know, I appreciate Deeb doing this, but from a fairness standpoint, I am a bit concerned. I think the process should either be formalized or or deep not be involved in that. I mean, if, if individuals on a personal level want to take that on and communicate with staff, I have no problem with that. But, you know, deep formally working with applicants or it, it, it to me is a bit of unfairness if we don't have a formal program that's announced and, uh, you know, people are notified so that the public are aware that that's available to them. So, those are just my two cents. I, I wouldn't be opposed. I, I actually would support looking into this to seeing if it, it would be something that would be workable and effective. But just share my concern with that little tidbit of potential unfairness. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just brought to my attention that this actually was in our original work plan when we were created, or not work plan, but bylaws when D was formed, that that was part of the intent. Um, and I do know internally um, in, I believe, our last meeting, maybe two meetings ago, the question had come up of how is Deeb supposed to handle um, comments from the public uh, related to these things, whether they're in an, directly in an issue or being um, they've heard of one. And we were also un unclear, and so I think um, it's a, a good idea to continue the conversation with April um, of what could a more formal process look like. And um, I personally would agree, I don't want everything to come to Deeb. We don't have time for that. So how would we determine what things come to Deeb versus what things do not? You know, we've kind of outlived several different staff changes and different heads of departments. And Ali, our previous, or one of the previous uh, engineering managers, used to mention that as a option for whenever there was a disagreement. And in the, the next route was if, if they disagreed with staff, then you'd submit it to Deeb. And it was a formal process and it, it, it was advertised. Now, I think we could do better. I think we could put it right on maybe our web page or on you know, the county's web page that if you do have a, a formal, like almost an appeal of a, a staff decision, then it could come before Deeb. And, and that's already something we do. But I don't know that the general public knows that. So we could probably do a better job with that. It says that the items are by law. Um, the advisory board shall review and comment as requested by the county manager or the council or senior staff. So it would have to come from through, us. through you. Yes. Right. And I think that there, there could be, you know, there's a regulatory framework <clears throat> that we operate in uh, and it, it, there could be a lot of disagreements with that regulatory framework, but it is what it is. So I could see this really unleashing a whole can of worms, but if it comes through the county manager, the council, maybe that that is, or or a recommendation from staff to us that this is, this is a difficult one, and maybe we need to get an, another opinion on it. So I think let's let's keep talking about this. But again, I feel very cautious. So I may disagree with Councilor Marshall on this, and so and agree with Glenn on this. I'm not sure where Karen is. I would ask you. Um, my, you know, this is my thought. And I I think we have three that may support this. You come up with with that process, and you propose it. I think the key here is we don't want to open up a can of worms, and we don't want to slow up the process. We want to speed it up. So the key here is once you internally figure out, hey, this is how it could work for us, that it's done in conjunction side by side with April, so it works for permitting and for her specifically so we because we don't want to overburden you we don't want to over, overburden our permitting process we want to speed things up not slow things down and we don't want to open up the proverbial can of worms so uh, do we have a kind of a thumbs up to, to to have them start working on that it's already in their portfolio I mean that's what started the conversation with Eric and I is hey it's in our portfolio uh, we could be doing this in a more uh, structured way. 
Yeah, and I haven't. Please. Yeah, and I haven't heard if we've got three that support that yet. Um, but I know April's always willing to work with Deeb, and she has over the last year. Um, I do think it, there needs to be some very clear expectations and roles and responsibilities because I also want to make sure we're not putting them in a conflict of interest if any of the project concerns are with any of the Deeb members as well. So I think um, get, sending it back with April and Deeb to brainstorm how and what this could look like and bring that back to council. Uh, do we have three thumbs up to do that? Okay, I see two, three, and Glenn, for some reason I don't see you. Are you? Yeah, I, Are you my there? time's up. Yeah, I, I appreciate okay, thank the you. addition of April being involved in that process so that it's a, a joint venture. Okay, so can we move on now? Thank you. Do you mind right. if I say something really quick? That's April, sure. Yes, April, go ahead. April 1st, Community <laughs> Development Director. Um, I, I, and they said it at the beginning, they, we, they, they do this in a somewhat more casual um, way right now. Uh, definitely deep has <laughs> we, no problem bringing me the issues that happen, even if it's with specific subjects right now. So um, I do believe that they are doing this in, in a way. Um, so I understand the need to, um, uh, formalize it as far as building code goes, though, there is, um, there is an avenue when it, when a developer or builder, um, has a different thought about code, we can, we can bring it to the Washington state building code council and ask for their interpretation. Um, and then they're also, I'll be looking into creating a board of appeals for, um, building code that's specific to Park County. That sounds like a long outside bureau, bureaucratic process that I'd hope to avoid. Uh, anyway, um, any, anything else before we move on? Please go ahead. All right, so looking ahead to 2024, um, rather than go line by line, we're going to focus on highlighting kind of what we think is going to take up most of our time. Um, starting with the um, working with the county staff on the 2025 comprehensive plan. So as um, you have all been shown by county staff, um, there's been some changes to the comp plan update for 2025 and how that's done. And um, two big components of that are um, one, there's middle bill housing um, that has been approved at the state level that's going to impact some of this, as well as the implementation of um, the uh, area median income. So when you're looking at housing type and what we're missing in our county and our region, um, that's a component that we haven't had to factor in before when we're coming up with um, the, the updates. So um, we, we will likely spend a lot of time in that arena. Um, the middle bill housing impacts, um, uh, right now it's really promoting uh, duplex, uh, triplex, quadplexes on single family um, residential properties. And while most of the impacts are targeted directly at cities, um, it's the unique makeup of Clark County. Um, the discussion about will the county want to voluntarily participate in some of these programs, um, I think is a worthwhile conversation to have um, given how we're, we're made up. So um, under the comprehensive plan, there's also, as you're aware, the compliant co climate component um, that uh, Oliver and his team have been working really hard on. I know several D members have sat in on um, the kind of conversations about how are we going to form these groups. And then a few, um, I believe a couple of um, D members have also applied to be part of those um, groups to further that conversation. <clears throat> and then built in there's you know, we had discussion around, do we need to revisit the capital facilities plan based on some of these changes from the state? We know that's already been approved, but there's some concern about um, creating density in some areas that maybe we didn't plan for when we originally adopted the capital facilities. 
Um, and then also, what are the impacts on the vacant buildable lands model? So um, there's a lot happening in that one that's going to take up a lot of time. Um, <laughs> and then the other component that is also sort of related, um, knowing about it's all housing, right, is the um, to work with the county staff. So I'm jumping down to item six. Uh, work with the county staff to identify or to implement findings from the Housing Options Advisory Board. Um, we were really, as Seth mentioned, we're really um, involved and vocal uh, on the single family home side, uh, residential side, and then um, we will, uh, we also are sitting on the, um, the mixed use and multifamily um, to hopefully uh, influence and provide some feedback on that. Um, and then a similar process that we did with the single family code changes, we will do um, this time around with the um, mixed use and multifamily, working with them on what the code modifications will be, um, working on any new codes that need to be written, uh, and then looking at incentives for infill developments or simplified site plans for less than eight units. Um, and then, uh, as we've, Seth mentioned before, monitoring what other jurisdictions are doing, what are best practices, and then providing those to um, the county staff to hopefully implement it in the county. So I will stop there. Those are two big ones. Um, see if you have any questions on those, or I can pass it over to Ryan to talk about a couple more items. Thank you. Uh, I would say this is at least a two-year work plan that you've laid out here. Uh, at, at, at minimum, gets us through 2025 and the adoption of the uh, comprehensive plan. So I appreciate your focus on all of that. We're all going to be working very hard on that. Um, related to housing, I know I was reminded yesterday it's taken us four years to address phase one, which was considered the low-hanging fruit, uh, and so now we're into phase two, and in as much as that can move along, uh, it'll be harder decisions to make, uh, but if it can be in some way ad, uh, inform the uh, housing requirements in the comp plan, that would be, that would be great. Uh, and I, I would really like, I know it's, it's a complex uh, landscape and understanding, because I think we really have to rely on the building community and your expertise because we're in a crisis now related to housing and we see it also in the rise in homelessness. So, so we really all need to work together on this. Uh, and I would like to better understand, because that, that phase one, so what we understand about it is it may better address the 100 to 120 uh, of the uh, median income, but it's that zero to 100 that we have a huge need in that area. And it'd be good to understand and get your input on what incentives could work, because I think there's regulatory, there's incentives, and there's just, we just, the public, uh, we, we just have to, uh, you know, provide funding for uh, supportive housing. So really understanding what, what are the best options within all of those that can, can move us along really as quickly as possible and when, what funding resources might be out there for us. That's, that's uh, a lot of what I've been thinking about. Thanks. Go. I don't hear any other questions. Uh, did you have more of a presentation? I believe Ryan has a couple things that he wanted to talk about as well. Um, yeah, this will just be really quick. I was on the single family housing options board, although uh, some of my colleagues were more active on that one. Um, the multifamily one is probably one that I'm a little bit more focused on, which is just getting kicked off again. Um, you know, the multifamily and mixed use. And in particular, you know, we're going to be looking at how the code supports the comp plan and whether or not how feasible the code currently is to meet the density and affordability um, criteria that are in the comp plan and trying to make sure that the code 
that the outcome of that process really supports the, the goals of the county. So, um, I guess the, the only other one that was on my list that wasn't hasn't been already been covered was we, we continue to monitor the road mod process and provide recommendations on that as well. I think I would just end with echoing what I think you opened with um, even before we started, which was um, Deeb agrees um, timelines um, being part of the conversation is really important. Um, so in matters of interpretation, those situations, Deeb would also request um, that we can be part of that conversation um, because we're working in multiple jurisdictions. They're um, the individuals in this room are the experts in this arena and they can help um, hopefully lessen the number of uh, individual situations that cause longer timelines or um, implementation of code that is higher than um, what other jurisdictions are and higher than, than what the code was intended to be. Um, so I think we just kind of wanted to end with that message that we're here as a resource um, and would love to um, be part of those conversations, which April is usually really great about bringing to us, but I just want to reinforce that. And one other item just to kind of build off what, uh, what Sherry said and the kind of things that we mentioned earlier. And I want to stress that this board is your advisor. We're here to serve you. Um, in the past, I think our, our role has changed recently, and I'd like to get back to what we used to do. And we used to have a lot more participation in work sessions and hearings. Um, and, and I feel what's happening now, and it's frustrating on our point where we put a tremendous amount of volunteer work in, and then we get to a work session or a hearing, we're not even able to, to participate in the work session, which we used to be able to do. And then we have three minutes to talk at the hearing. And there's a lot of times when I'm sitting out in the audience and there's questions that you had that we've done a tremendous amount of research on, we have the answer, but we don't have that ability to participate. We're not necessarily, we put in this volunteer, we donate our time, we put a lot of effort in to advise the board. So I wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that and however we can serve you, we're here to do that. Uh, we'd also like to make sure that the, the work we put in makes it to you guys and you are advised properly. Yeah, thanks for that. And that's come up before. And we, we have made exceptions at work sessions on different topics to allow outside presenters, if you will, uh, to come and, and assist or even do the presentation themselves. So <clears throat> I appreciate you bringing that up once again because I, I absolutely value your input. And uh, when these questions come up and we have differences of opinion, you know, first thing is, well, what does Deeb think? You know, what's their input? So I think we do need to have that discussion on, uh, you know, more formalizing. I, I, because I don't know what it looked like uh, previously. You know, joined the council in 2019. I don't know what it was like before. But I, I certainly support your request to uh, have more access during these work sessions. We'll have to discuss that and see how it will look. Uh, Sue, you have just just a thought on that because I think when it comes to comprehensive plan update, there's a, there's a lot of segments of the population who feel like they have zero representation. So it's always a push and pull. And uh, I appreciate the role that you play in your input, but you know I would really like to assure that all segments uh, have equal access to us as policymakers. So just, again, a cautionary note. Yeah, I think it uni universally, we sincerely appreciate all the volunteer work you do with all the expertise that you bring. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to look for avenues to give you voice because it's just going to make our decisions that much better. I think um, in the past, it's been kind of on demand. So during a hearing, Sometimes you ask questions of staff. Um, you also have the ability to ask questions of your advisory boards at, at the hearings, at the, the work sessions. And in those situations, we can provide input if we have it. There might be times where we don't have input on that topic and, and maybe we have to take it back to the board and, and return with advice. And going back to this depth and breadth of your work, I mean, I, I, you obviously all have type AAA personalities and are looking on to taking on all this additional work as volunteers. We're so grateful for that. Uh, and we may end up 
exceeding your capacity at some point. But I just, yeah, ha I just have a couple other quick comments. Uh, uh, condos you know, and the legislature, I know there needs to be some changes there, but I think condos is really uh, opportunity miss for that uh, building equity. Uh, I know my son was able to start out with a condo, so whatever we can do to help with that. We have our own lobbyists, so coordinating on uh, state legislation, I think we can uh, put them to work a little more than we have. Uh, and the livability uh, issues, uh, and, and you know, I like parks and trails and all of those things, and maybe collaborating with the uh, Parks Commission on, you know, some innovative things. So that's a component of the uh, comp plan update as well. So livability, if we can all keep that in mind, yeah, you know, we're trying to do everything. We want to be able to meet all things. And, and then transit-oriented uh, development. I know there's been some legislation related to that. And there's, uh, in the county, there's, you know, a few areas that might uh, be um, suitable for really bringing all those components together for a complete community, walkable, uh, and you can have affordable housing and mixed use. So. So that, that's another area that uh, I've been thinking about. But anyway, thanks thanks really so much for your efforts here. So are you looking for a formal thumbs up on your work plan that you've just briefed us on? <laughs> <laughs> I think we bring it to you every year to just go over really quickly, see if there's anything that we've missed that you want us to focus on. Um, yeah, so as to Sue's last comment, I would just say this too. I, I was always perplexed why we didn't have condos in our portfolio. And obviously after yesterday, I mean, we are looking mm -hmm. to solve this with every possible mechanism to create generational wealth with every economic level within this county and, and to get people off the streets, keep them in homes. Uh, so if condo is another tool that we need to uh, pursue, you know, we have a pretty cooperative local legislative delegation. And so if you have specific arguments, you would like, you know, and we have a lobbyist, but, but we also meet with our local legislative delegation. You know, this session's gone, but right now is the day to start working on next session. So if you have ideas like that, make it make it known to us. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I am going to say anything surprising. We've done a number of condos over the years. Um, you know, we we like designing condos, but it's it's convincing developers to do them. It's all about liability. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that I think there's been a lot of good work in the legislature on that. I think we're going to start to see them more. But I think there needs to be kind of a, a thawing out in the developer community. We, we need to maybe get that message to the developers out there that condos are back on the table. I agree 100%. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kat, uh, Glenn, you're out there. You have something? Yeah, I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about the condos and, you know, if from, you know, from my under, you know, I, I hear from multiple different sources, but that's the first that I've heard that really the problem had been completely resolved at the state level. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more of that, perhaps just private, you know, in the back channel or something. But, uh, you know, if, if it needs to thaw, maybe we can think of ways that we can incentivize condos so i would be interested in in hearing of any ideas of that as well to where we can kind of jump start that production okay well i think you have enthusiastic enthusiastic audience here for all of your input one last you have one last i do Go ahead. um i just it, we, we've been talking about deep all day i'd like to turn this back to staff uh, we wouldn't be who we are without county staff. Uh, they have been as much a partner in this endeavor over the last, wow, 15, 18 years. Eric, you've been on here since day one, 06? 06. Um, they have been as much a partner in this as, as we have been part of the board. 
Um, and I want to just make, let you know that I've been on almost every single stakeholder group that has had anything to do with any code changes, policy changes as far as permitting is concerned. And they have gone over and above to make improvements over the years um, with the uh, cutting review timelines, with um, simplifying uh, uh, the review, the initial fully complete review, for getting the word out to uh, the consultants as far as what the expectations are. And I want to just, you know, they have not been sitting on their hands uh, doing nothing. They have really been putting in the effort uh, that has been necessary in order to <clears throat> uh, improve the process as we've all been trying to get to. We're maybe not there yet, but we're a lot better off than we were 5, 10, 15 years ago. A couple examples of that are, uh, oh, I know. Couple of, one example of that is that um, allowing a, full, a, a final engineering plan review uh, or building permit review concurrent with final engineering plan review. That is not what other jurisdictions do. You have to have final plan engineering plan review before they'll even look at the building plan. That extends any project four, five, six months. So I just want to let, you know, make sure that the council knows that Staff is as much a part of DEEB as DEEB is a part of the county and this process. So just want to make sure that everybody's fully aware of that and um, that they deserve our thanks as well. That's thank, it. thank you for that. Okay, I think we, uh, one more. All right. I, I can, I can <laughs> add in regards to the condos, just this is just more so informational. Um, uh, there, ha there was legislation that was passed related to helping um, helping to not make it as easy to pursue uh, litigation against developers of condo projects. So that um, the problem that we've had is we've had such a gap in time from when condos have been constructed. And so there's a few issues and that is it, there's not a market that necessarily had been proven out. I think everyone's aware as far as it's in the industry that there's a demand for it. But then you have an issue on the finance side. And so the finance side, we always have to have comparables to show what the market will support and unfortunately we don't have those comparables. And um, another dynamic we have in our side of the river is uh, we actually are exceeding the cost of the other side of the river, which is Portland. And that's a, that's a flip from what it's been historically. We haven't seen that uh, ever in, in my experience or understanding of the history of Vancouver and Clark County. So. Um, that's a dynamic that makes it difficult when there's less expensive housing over there to create new condos is difficult on the finance side. So unfortunately that then the only tool um, that I could see council being able to provide is something that we see with city of Vancouver, which is property taxes and tax abatement that happens with certain lengths of time that can help for projects to be more affordable and attainable. Um, that. I, you know, I'm sure that there, there could be some other um, ideas, but that's the only lever that I really know of that's available to council. Um, obviously, there could be some, there's affordability that's brought in with that abatement, um, and so that would be the consideration that helps to provide that supply. Um, given the current finance uh, world, uh, it's difficult to see that that's going to change over the next year, but I think after that, if we see rates adjust, we'll We'll also see then with that um, the ability for developers to try and meet and provide that kind of product. So something just to keep in mind. Super. Thanks for all that. I think April just wanted to say one quick thing. Yes, please, April. Go ahead. I do, Chair. Thank you so much, April, for Director of Community Development. Um, I'm not saying this because Mike said nice things about us. Um, I, I, do, I do appreciate Deeb. Um, you know, we recently met with other jurisdictions about 5290, and um, I really felt like Clark County was ahead of the curve uh, based on what the other jurisdictions need to do to comply. And I really think that a lot of that, and I would say over 50% of that is because we have DEEB, and DEEB continues to challenge us to be better, which makes us look at our processes to be better and um, and they challenge us in a respectful and professional way. And and I think that Clark County and this, the, us as an organization and for our constituents, I think that we're better because we have deep. 
So thank you guys. Okay, well, on that very positive note, and I wasn't ignoring you, April. I just don't, I don't see the hands raised. I don't, I just didn't know you had wanted to comment. So I believe that concludes this presentation, and that is the last work session. So we um, will go ahead and adjourn until one when we have our afternoon meeting. Thank you so much for all attending and for all you do every day. Thank you. Much appreciated.